Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Ezekiel 41. We're going to look at verses 15 through 26, because we kind of saw the first half of verse 15 in yesterday's devotion. And in the way that we set up the verses uh, through the King James translation, we sort of awkwardly stopped halfway through a sentence with verse 15. So here's the text. Next, he measured the length of the building facing the temple yard to the west with its galleries on each side. It was 175 feet. The interior of the great hall and the porticos of the court, the thresholds, the beveled windows, and the balconies all around with their three levels opposite the threshold were overlaid with wood on all sides. They were paneled from the ground to the windows, but the windows were covered. Reaching to the top of the entrance and as far as the inner temple and on the outside, on every wall all around on the inside and the outside was a pattern carved with cherubim and palm trees. There was a palm tree between each pair of cherubim. Each cherub had two faces, a human face turned toward the palm tree on one side and a lion's face turned toward it on the other. They were carved throughout the temple on all sides. Cherubim and palm trees were carved from the ground to the top of the entrance and on the wall of the great hall. Okay, we're going to come back to these and talk about why, because this is not just a decorative choice. This is symbolic of something profound. It's an encapsulation, a framing of history, beginning with Eden, ending with the millennial reign of Christ in this temple, whose specs we now have the angel of the Lord himself showing us and measuring for Ezekiel that we might see this. This is the most exhaustive description in all of, uh, uh, of Scripture about this millennial temple. There's nothing like this in Revelation. All right, we see an angel measure the heavenly city, but this is exhaustive detail. The doorposts of the great hall were square, and the front of the sanctuary had the same appearance. The altar was made of wood, five and one fourth feet high and three and a half feet long. It had corners. And uh, its length and sides were of wood. The man told me, this is the table that stands before the Lord. The great hall and the sanctuary each had a double door. And each of those doors had two swinging panels. There were two panels for one door and two for the other. Cherubim and palm trees were carved on the doors of the great hall like those carved on the walls. There was a wooden canopy outside in front of the portico. There were beveled windows and palm trees on both sides. On the side walls of the portico, the side rooms of the temple, and the canopies. So this is exquisite detail. It's beautiful, and there's something to that. As Protestants, we, we kind of like build boxes and worship in them. And it's because aesthetics are not necessary. They're not, e they're not even prescribed biblically. Like they're, they're, You don't need to have a beautiful space to worship in. In fact, like I've said before, I've helped... Uh, plant churches in Brazil, and then the churches that we planted help, you know, planted other churches, and then they don't need us anymore. So we haven't been back since. We just keep in touch online. But in launching one of those churches, there was a woman in a village called Jaquitae. She opened up her backyard, and that was where the church was going to start. And I'm just sitting on a plastic lawn chair, drumming on a bucket, surrounded by chickens, feeling the Holy Spirit of God like it's the day of Pentecost. And then I've also toured some of the most exquisite cathedrals in the world. I've, I've toured cathedrals in Ireland. I've even went to a Palm Sunday service at a Catholic church in Ireland. Uh, I've toured countless cathedrals throughout Cambridge, um, not in the U.S., but in the U.K. And some of those belong to uh, Cambridge University and, and the colleges that comprise Cambridge University, uh, where... They're just straight up atheistic institutions. So like I've, I've experienced the Holy Spirit of God sitting on a lawn chair in a backyard surrounded by chickens more than I have uh, in a massive priceless cathedral with five story tall stained glass windows. So you don't need aesthetics. You don't need them, but they're cool and there's beauty in them. And it's something that I do. I do hope that Protestants, you know, uh, within reason, you know, like do, do, uh, put money toward ministry first and foremost. But uh, man, like if you're one of those churches that just has buckets of money and a massive endowment, 
if you invest in beauty, I think that it'll return tenfold uh, because people will make pilgrimages to behold beautiful spectacles, especially those that are intentionally in, intended to convey the beauty and glory of God. For the Redemption Church, uh, I've got this crazy idea for a glass rooftop chapel for weddings and for funerals. The reason that I want to do it that way is so that it can light up the night in more ways than one, literally and spiritually, but also uh, it is a functional part of the building that allows us to have a steeple where uh, King County won't let us. <laughs> All right. So, and and I, uh, you know, I know that that's that's like the that's at the very bottom of our to do list, and it keeps getting bumped down. All right. But one day, if it's God's will, uh, and the people are able to give in such a way that we're able to do ministry and have leftover funds to be able to do something like that, I do think that long term. Uh, investing in beautiful structures works. I know that because because I've paid money to go tour dead church facilities just because they were beautiful and just to go in there and worship in them one more time. I stood in there with my kids and I sang, uh, I sang Agnus Dei uh, because it just felt like that's what this thing was for and that's what it ought to do. And I love the acoustics of those kind of buildings. Uh, there was a, a Catholic... Uh, a, 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 a cathedral in Seattle that came up for sale and I wanted it so bad. And uh, my team was like, Jesse, you do not want the deferred maintenance costs on a medieval castle in Seattle. <laughs> like, But I just thought it'd be so cool to see like, you know, uh, our guitarist Tyler standing there with his electric guitar in front of a stained glass window. Like just, that's what I pictured in my head. And like, imagine what the drums sound like uh, <laughs> inside a castle. Oh man, that just sounded cool to me. Uh, but that's at the very bottom of our to-do list and other more important things keep coming in the way. Uh, but it doesn't mean that beauty in architecture is completely off the radar. Um, and it is something that we as Protestants have not prioritized at all. Uh, because like I said, it's not necessary, but it does have value. And there's beauty in the millennial temple of Christ, where he will reign in Jerusalem for 1000 years. Now, let's talk about these architectural cues, these cherubim and palm trees. Okay, for one thing, I, I think that we may have also seen, uh, we may have also seen this table before the Lord. It, it reminds me of the incense altar that we studied in Exodus. Okay, when we went through, uh, when we went through the book of Exodus, let's see, we would have hit uh, chapter 30 in one of our sermons. And uh, it's called Heaven on Earth. And uh, it is, yeah, the title of the sermon is Heaven on Earth. And it's in the, the Exodus series. Uh, it was that law, uh, law prophecy and, and fulfillment. So look up that one, Heaven on Earth, because this was in that sermon. You were to make an altar for the burning of incense, make it of acacia wood. It must be square, 18 inches long and 18 inches wide. It must be 36 inches high. Its horns must be of one piece with it, overlay its top and all around its sides and its horns with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. It just kind of reminds me of this table that's before the Lord in the Millennial Temple. There's different specs, different, different dimensions to it, uh, but they bear some similarity. And I just wanted to point that out. When we were looking at this stuff in Exodus, the tabernacle, it was a foreshadowing of the temple. That temple was destroyed and rebuilt. That temple was destroyed. Now there's a dome of the rock on it. But one day, the millennial temple, you may call it, you may call it the third temple, there's going to be a, a wood table before the Lord. Now, in the beginning of Ezekiel, we're, we, we saw this incredible, incredible stuff. Right, I looked and there was a whirlwind coming from the north, like a tornado, a huge cloud with fire flashing back and forth and brilliant light all around it. In the center of the fire, there was a gleam like amber. The likeness of four living creatures came from it and this was their appearance. Okay, do you remember this sermon? This was our first sermon uh, in Ezekiel. It's titled, And Then You Will Know. And we're now at the end of Ezekiel. That's Ezekiel 1. And we're in our last week in this series. And we're starting to see some of the same things come back. Okay, he does what he can to describe uh, the living creatures. I think it's in chapter 4, chapter 7. Uh, one of those, 1, 4, 7, 11, one of those where uh, it's, it's spelled out that these are cherubim. Cherubim is plural for cherub. Cherub is an angel. And he's describing them in vague terms like this in, in chapter one. And we can see that they had four faces and four wings. Now, the, the cherubim that he saw in chapter one are different from these cherubim because these 
cherubim have two faces. One is the face of a man. The other is the face of a lion. Okay. Uh, you can see each cherub had two faces in verse 18 of today's text. So they're not identical to the ones that he saw at first, but I'm struck by the way that Ezekiel's ministry is framed. As we come to the close, we're reminded of the beginning. Now, the first temple, 1 Kings 6, 29 and 30, look at this. He carved all the surrounding temple walls with carved engravings, cherubim, palm trees, ah, get it? And flower blossoms. Now those weren't, those aren't in the millennial temple. No flower blossoms on the millennial temple. In the inner and outer sanctuaries, he overlaid the temple floor with gold in both the inner and the outer sanctuaries. So Solomon's temple was incredibly beautiful. And even the second temple, though not as beautiful, was still beautiful enough to make the Romans dismantle it brick by brick, convinced that there was gold inside the walls. And I've heard of even gold just drip, poured down from the top of the thing. Uh, but look at the look at the consistency, particularly the cherubim and the palm trees uh, with the carved engravings surrounding the temple walls. So that motif is present in the millennial temple as well. Just no flower blossoms. Sorry, I guess the millennial temple is more manly. Now, these cherub, cherubim, we've, we've seen them before. And in fact, in Genesis 3.24, man is cast out uh, of Eden, the Garden of Eden. And station, uh, God stationed cherubim and the flaming, whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Uh, geographically, we know that the Garden of Eden was at the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, but post-flood, we have no clue where that really lines up geographically. The antediluvian world is a mystery to us. I think that what we once ref uh, what we refer to as, as Pangea, I think that that's probably antediluvian uh, topography. And this guardian, the, the, this, this, these guardian cherubim and this flaming whirling sword uh, we don't know where that is geographically, but it exists in the spiritual realm. We can't see it, but it's been there since the beginning. And so the first temple built by Solomon had cherubim and palm trees. Uh, these cherubim have been serving a guardian role. Okay. A guardian cherub is even a title given to uh, Lucifer originally lamenting his fall in Ezekiel 28. So why the motif of the palm trees and the cherubim on every wall all around on the inside and the outside was a pattern carved with cherubim and palm trees. There was a palm tree between each pair of cherubim. Each cherub had two faces, a human face turned toward the, uh, the palm tree on one side and a lion's face turned toward it on the other. They were carved throughout the temple on all sides. Cherubim and palm trees were carved from the ground to the top of the entrance and on the wall of the great hall. At Seahawks games, uh, I was telling my friend Steve-O, uh, who I think may be worshiping with us. If you're watching this, Steve-O, you're the man. Uh, when we have the national anthem at Seahawks games, when we get to the Rockets' red glare, red Rockets shoot from uh, the, which one is that? Southern end zone scoreboard. And then uh, the bombs bursting in air, fireworks shoot from the northern end zone. And then when we say banner yet wave, the team holding the massive American flag out over the field waves it. Uh, and then we have the flyover. Uh, sometimes we time it well with uh, uh, land of the free and home of the brave. And sometimes there's a delay, but it's always cool. And what I was joking about was like, it's kind of on the nose. Like we're really driving home, like get it? <laughs> the stuff in the lyrics is happening. <laughs> red rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air banner yet wave get it the banner waving see uh i i feel similarly about the cherubim and the palm tree motive because it's so ubiquitous it's driven home it's like do you get it it's everywhere it's floor to ceiling inside outside cherubim palm trees cherubim palm trees cherubim palm trees god like really drives this home inside the temple and outside the temple of the millennial temple where jesus himself will reign in jerusalem for a thousand years he's really driving this home okay and it takes us even back to our series the uh, holy dissident, Isaiah the prophet, we've seen this as well in Isaiah 37, uh, verse 16. Here it is. Lord of armies, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you made the heavens and the earth. 
And so we have these cherubim uh, plainly present, you know, in, uh, in the temple, inside and out and all over the place. This, by the way, was also uh, in our Isaiah series. In fact, uh, Isaiah book two, part two, um, what is that, session seven? Of, uh, of, of the overall series through Isaiah, we studied this text. Isaiah 37, 14 through 29 was the focal text for the curriculum. It went with the sermon titled, How to Pray and Be Answered, Isaiah Sermon 7. So Isaiah Session 7 studied this text for more on this. Uh, there, are cherub, uh, there are cherubim guarding the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, and there are cherubim lining the millennial temple, uh, the tree of life in Eden brings our minds to the tree of life in the heavenly city, which a member of our church right now is currently writing a song about. It'd be pretty cool. Stay tuned for more on that. And these cherubim serve this function of guarding. And so there's this depiction of the guardian cherub and the fruitfulness of the Garden of Eden, uh, this palm tree uh, that is driven home, like on the nose, floor to ceiling, inside and outside in the millennial kingdom. He is king. He is the Lord of armies. He's the God of Israel. He's enthroned between the cherubim. He's God. He alone is God. And he's the God over all the kingdoms of all the earth. He made the heavens and the earth. So this is more than just a decorative motif. It's not like God said, you know what would look pretty nice is uh, some cherubim and a few palm trees. Maybe we'll ditch the flowers. That looked good on Solomon's temple, but I don't think Jesus' temple should have flowers. Yeah, that's pretty good. Call Chip and Joanna and ask them to make some, uh, you know, some cherubim art. But let's, let's do away with the beast of burden face on the cherubim. Let's do away with... Uh, the let's do away with the eagle face. You know those creep people out. Let's just let's just go with something that would look simpler. Lion, dude, and those are your cherubim. Give them a palm tree to look at on either side. That'll look nice. This is not a this is not a decorating competition. This is deliberate. This is the temple where Jesus will reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years, and this is the theme that is driven home on the nose, floor to ceiling, inside out. The Lordship of Jesus, King Jesus, the Lion of Judah, fully God, fully man, between the cherubim, Eden is back. Things will end in perfection as they began in perfection. That perfection will come by fire, the fire of God's judgment, where he will create all things new. And because of our memory eternal, of what God has done here, we will exist in an even better eternity, I'd argue, precisely because of the fire and the judgment. That memory will make the future heaven rebellion proof forever. And it gives us all the more reason to look at the Redeemer who redeemed everything. He alone is the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim he is the God over all the kingdoms of the earth. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one enthroned between the cherubim. It's Jesus.